Hello and welcome to episode number 361 of the Armin Show podcast, science, people, creativity, learning more, subscribe if you haven't, the YouTube is growing, so is it on Spotify, Apple, iTunes, wherever it might be, follow the show, it is booming out here. On this episode, we have a guest, a researcher, a professor, Professor Kayleen McClanahan. Kayleen, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, I'm so delighted to be here. I'm very glad to have you on here. You're affiliated with the University of California, Los Angeles. Shout outs to our local UCLA. I am in Los Angeles. Some of your research interests are hierarchy, dominance, status, intergroup relations, and diversity. You're a postdoctoral fellow at the UCLA Anderson School of Management. Got your PhD from Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern and would be in the category of social scientists studying social hierarchies. That is cool. Now, exactly. yep. Uh, currently, you are not at UCLA. What has caused you to not be at that institution? And where are you currently? And what are you doing at that location? Uh, so I, I'm affiliated with UCLA. I'm just not in LA. Um, so I am in Salt Lake City right now. I have um, family here. So I am working remotely um, and enjoying some time here. That's cool. Wonderful. Long live. Uh, Colorado region, Utah region can be known as beautiful part of the country that many people would like to go to for its scenic qualities. That's cool. Yeah, I would recommend it for that. Absolutely. Lots of people. People go there. Now, you're in the category of social science and research in that field. What led you in that direction? Why not something like any other category? <laughs> That's, that's a good question. Um, it, it was definitely a, a question that I asked myself a lot during undergrad. Um, I think I ended up in a business school in a pretty unconventional route. So my undergraduate degree was in family, um, family psychology and human development. Um, and after I finished that degree, I was like, I don't really know what I want to do. So I think I will continue going to school, which I think um, is a, a more common pass path to academia than, than you would think. Um, so I did a master's in that as well in, in family psychology. And uh, the professor that I worked with during my master's, um, Jeff Hill, who was really wonderful, did a lot of research on work-family balance. So he was approaching um, family psychology from that perspective. And as a result, some of the um, journals that we were trying to publish in were family psychology focused, but some were more organizational behavior and management focused um, because both sides are interested in those issues. And so that was really my introduction to management and organizational behavior. And I didn't really realize that there was the option of doing social science um, in a business school. And so it was after my master's that I pivoted and I applied to management PhD programs. I ended up um, at Kellogg at Northwestern in um, got my PhD in management and organizations there. And that is a pretty um, unique and special group because there's um, a mix of people with training in management research, but also people with training in social psychology and sociology. Um, and so my research has a bit of a hint of, of social, social psychology to some of it as well, despite being um, in a business school. Hmm. When you were mentioning earlier, Continuing from one path to the next, there was one book, which I don't know. Yeah, I do have it. Yet. It talked about how it was the, the real world of college by two uh, professors about how it actually looked at the percentage of people that just continue their path. Uh, like, I got to just keep going versus uh, it would lead me directly to this job. Like the decisions that people make at that point. It's nice that every little element, one by one, thanks to researchers, is figured out in a way. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's also nice when like some decisions that you make as like a dumb 20 year old and <laughs> end up leading you to a place where you're actually happy with your career. Um, so, so I feel very fortunate in that, in that regard. That's true. There's a little bit of entropy to it. Like I will leave it to chance and oh, it worked out. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. One other cool thing, uh, before get into your material is that a proponent of reproducible science and an avid R user. What is R and what can people use R for? So great question. R is a statistical, uh, it's a programming language that's focused around statistics. Um, so like 
if you are familiar with Python, R is kind of like a Python alternative that was originally developed by statisticians. So if the majority of what you're doing is stats, I, I think that R is a great language to learn. And as a result, um, that's like the way that I do all of my analyses is, is through R. And the nice thing about R is that like Python, it's open source, which means um, it's free and available to anyone. And as a result, there's like tons and tons of online resources to anybody that's trying to learn R, um, although it is a bit of a, a bit of a learning curve. Um, so I actually, I taught myself R. Um, I'm a big fan now. I wasn't when I was learning it because it, it, like I said, it, it's a bit of a, a learning curve. Um, but the, also the nice thing is because it's freely available, people um, who are avid users build tools um, that are helpful for them and then they share them with the world. So if you're trying to do a very specific analysis, that's not very common. There's like these beautiful, generous people out there who often have already figured out how you need to do it. And there's a package available that you can download and add on um, and, and use. So it's, uh, you can tell that I, <laughs> I geek out about it a little bit um, because I think it's a really, really beautiful thing to, to be able to find um, a tool that, and most people are just doing this out of the generosity of their own hearts and out of enthusiasm for um, stats, which is which is pretty profound and cool, I think. They support the field. One question that comes to mind there is, there's a learning curve. How long would you say it was before it was quite useful to you from when you started learning it to the point where, okay, this is like, uh, less of learning and more of usefulness. What would you say about that? Oh, that's such a great and difficult to answer question because I think in some ways I still like am learning, uh, what I'm doing. Uh, I think, and it's also, you know, when you're a graduate student, you are doing so many different things that I think that my learning curve with it was different than if I just like sat down for four months and dedicated my whole life to it. But I was like trying to learn R and also like taking classes and trying to learn how to do research, you know? So I was, I, I would say it was probably like a good few years before I felt comfortable and competent in R. Um, but again, I think that's partly because I wasn't focusing on it full time. So I have to give that disclaimer so I don't discourage anybody who wants to learn it. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, I always wonder about that. If you when, once you start something, uh, where's the time frame before it's now like on your page versus you are putting into it to figure it out? It's like a hill, and you're like once you cross the hill, now you're like using it, and you're figuring out more along the way. Yeah, I also like I have. I mean, I do have to be upfront. I part of my um, commitment to open science means that I post my code for my articles, like the analyses that I run online. And so anybody who actually knows R could look at those and be like, Ooh, she still, she still doesn't know. There's like, I, you know, I, I think that I'm functional, but I'm, I'm sure that there's always a difference between like um, somebody who can do something functionally and somebody who can do it really elegantly. And I know um, that the, where my, where I lie along that spectrum, certainly. <laughs> In a place of usefulness, we will call it a place of usefulness. I, I would, I would be flattered by that. <laughs> <laughs> it's great when code is available. You can always look at it and analyze it. And that's exactly what it is. It's not like behind some, uh, back room or something. That's cool. Yeah. Now the categories that you look at, uh, how connected would you say there are, let's say hierarchy, dominance, status, are these all very related or would you put them in separate groupings? Um, great question. So I think if you looked at individual papers that I'm pub I've published, you might not immediately think, oh, these are like super exactly the same. But I think um, there is one theme that ties all of my work together, and it's this idea of hierarchy pretty broadly. So I really have two streams to my research. Um, one looks at hierarchies between people in groups. So I look at like the dynamics between leaders and followers. I look at how people 
um, are able to get positions of influence over other people within a small group. Um, and that is some of the research that you reached, me at, reached out to me about, which is focused on, I look at dominance and prestige. I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, my other line of research looks at hierarchy on like a broader, more systemic scale. And then I think about hierarchy between groups of people. Um, so rather looking than looking at individuals within one group, I think about like how groups are arranged hierarchically within society. And so I look at these groups um, mostly in terms of race and gender. Um, and I work from theories that, that start with the assumption that we as humans have very strong group tendencies and often these groups vary in terms of privilege, um, like more privileged groups, such as white people or men and more marginalized groups, such as racial minorities or women. And um, as a result, a lot of that work you can imagine has implications for diversity and inclusion in organizations. So that's what a lot of my work has focused on is like how these um, racial inequalities or um, gender-based hierarchy um, impacts, you know, how to reduce those in workplaces um, or outside of workplaces. And, and I've also been focused a lot on allyship. So how uh, privileged group members like white people or men can advocate and help to minimize race or gender-based inequality. Now, how does how does how does one look at hierarchy in a workplace or location? Do you start to just survey everybody? How do you look at that? Yeah, so it's a great question, and I think that to answer the question, like one thing that I should point out is um, hierarchy takes so many different forms. So I think that. Often, like if you ask a traditional organizational behavior researcher to think about hierarchy, the first thing that comes into their mind might be like a traditional organizational hierarchy. So we have like this org chart and there's the CEO and then there's the C-suite and then there's this very formalized hierarchy. Um, and that is certainly one relevant and important form of hierarchy is formal hierarchy where everybody knows what it looks like and it's it's institutionalized in some way um but beyond that there's also informal hierarchies so even in groups where there's not an assigned leader what we see is that um, hierarchies emerge um, meaning that people end up having outweighted influence or outweighted say on what happens within the group um, and sometimes these hierarchies, these informal hierarchies emerge um, based on a person's competence or how likable they are. But we also know that like a person's demographics also impact the way that they are treated. And so sometimes these hierarchies emerge based on dimensions like race and gender. Um, and as a result, we also know that like race and gender, gender have systemically, there has been hierarchy um, based on opportunity and explicit exclusion and discrimination um, in like broader societal institutions. So you can see that there's like many different ways to think about hierarchy. And as a result, the methods change. Sorry, could you say that again? Oh, I'm My sorry. Apologies. I couldn't hear what you said. Sorry, Siri just was like asking. Sorry. I know what makes it me. <laughs> um, so, so depending on what type of hierarchy we're looking at, that can impact the methods. So this is, I'm giving a very long answer, but um, so often, so my, my methodology um, is, is kind of broad as a result, because I'm looking at like lots of different levels of hierarchy or types of hierarchy. So in some of my work, I um, use round robin surveys. And this is like, I don't know if you've ever worked in an organization where they have like 360 um, feedback and it's this idea. Okay, so so the idea of 360 feedback is rather than at the, having a performance review by just your manager, 
they want to get um, information from everybody um, that you interact with. So they might ask for information from your manager. They might ask for information from your subordinate, some of your clients, some of the, your peers in the organization so that they can get a broader view um, of, of what you are like as an employee. So I do something similar in my research where I will go in to groups of individuals and I will ask each individual in the group their um, perceptions of every other person in the group. And that can give you some pretty neat information because we know that a lot of times um, if you just ask somebody about their position in a group, they might not be super accurate in understanding how they are perceived by others. And so when we have everybody's perception, we can get more accurate ideas of how individuals are actually perceived. Um, so that's, so I've done quite a bit of that. I think that's a pretty exciting methodology. A lot of my work is also experimental in nature. Um, and so I will look at how people respond to different types of leaders or different types of be behaviors, depending on the gender of the leader, the leadership style that the leader is using, um, or not the leadership style, but like the strategy for, for hierarchy that they're using, um, their race, the type, you know, um, so I do, I do a lot of experiments, both in the lab and online. Um, I also have some studies, which I find to be pretty exciting, that use more like what I consider big data techniques. Um, so like getting data from Twitter um, and looking, looking at that, or um, I've also collected some data from participants attending a virtual conference. So, so really it's... Um, I just try and have a lot of tools that when I have a research question, I can pull um, from one of those, depending on what the best fit is and what's feasible. <laughs> one thing that comes to mind there, you mentioned Twitter and big data. I once had a lyric that I made, I wrote down data is the new oil. Rockefeller would get jealous. If he had some zeal, then Google's overzealous. That was like 10 years ago, but data, very important. Would you I say that? that? Thank you. <laughs> um, the is a lot of leadership being created online now uh more so than in person what am i trying to say like is a lot of what creates the status or cues for people in the category of leadership being created through someone's twitter presence or their other social place presence at this time uh maybe more so than even uh, off offline. Um, great question. I think that it's a question that I don't necessarily have the answer to, but I think that um, one one thing that I really value about the framework that I work from on my on my research on leadership and hierarchy within groups. So, so let me just actually step back and give you a little background on that theory, and then I'll explain why I think it's like really valuable thinking about. Um, our modern social interactions and online. So um, this theory, we call it the dual strategies theory of social rank. And when we talk about social rank, that just means like a position within the hierarchy. So somebody who has um, high social rank, they are either respected or they have a position in the form of hierarchy or they have a weighted influence, but like on some dimension, they are like higher in the hierarchy. That means they have social rank. And this theory suggests that people obtain social rank by using one of two strategies. And the first strategy is a dominance-based strategy. So these individuals um, claim positions of influence through being forceful or aggressive or coercive, um, but, but basically by um, doing what they need to, to, to get that position. Through force. They claim it through force. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, the second strategy is a prestige based strategy. And this is, as, as you can imagine, like a little bit more delicate of a strategy. These individuals tend to display competence. They sh show that they are a team player, that they're generous. And rather than trying to force their way to the top, people just like those traits. 
And as a result, they want to defer to those people. They want to know what those people's opinions are. They want to do what those people think is right because they value and respect that opinion. Um, so two very different strategies and both of those strategies we found are effective, um, which I think is interesting because I think a lot of times we want to assume that dominant people who tend to be a little bit more selfish and aren't even necessarily more competent, we want to assume that they wouldn't um, get influenced, but we, we do find that that is the case. And in some of my recent work, we actually find that at least in some contexts, these dominant individuals not only can like get positions of influence, but they can maintain these positions of influence over time. So that's like the, the brief synopsis of the theory. But what I find really exciting about this theory relative to a lot of theories in organizational behavior is that it's all about um, how these hierarchies emerge and how they can change. So it's a very, it, it accounts for malleability. And I think that a more traditional view of hierarchy is this assumption that we have leaders and followers, we have managers and subordinates, and it's kind of an immutable hierarchy and it's just taken for granted. And then we're like, okay, so we have the leaders and the followers and now what are their relationships like? Um, which is important, but the reality I think increasingly is that, that these hierarchies are changing and we see this in organizations because people are moving from job to job a lot more. We see a much higher population of the workforce that is doing um, gig work or contract work, meaning that they're not just in one organization with one boss. It means that they're constantly going into different organizations on shorter term bases. And then there's like a new hierarchy that emerges in each of those dynamics. Um, and and, and so there's a lot less stability. It's not like most people have a job where they start at entry level and they move up and they stay at the same organization for 50 years. I don't think that's most people's experience with employment anymore. And so having this theory that can account for how these hierarchies emerge and shape and are changed, I think is very exciting. And this is what, to finally circle back to your question, I think that it's also interesting to think about in the context of um, online presence or social media or influencers, because you see these changes happening um, where there's these there's this malleability of hierarchies. And you also see that, um, I think, due to increased information, my speculation is that people are going to places outside of their organization or outside of their immediate social group. And that impacts the way that they are thinking, like who they are deferring to, who they are getting information from, um, who they are influenced by um, in a way that highlights that it's not just one salient hierarchy and that's it. Does that make sense? Yes. A couple of things came to mind there. Also one thing we do like extensive, uh, more fuller is, 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 is liked here because- Great little like i think of it like a piano you know if you press the button and it extended out i mean you hold it down there and the note keeps going or it's staccato uh it's just it's very abrupt and such and you can't take so much from it and you can't get into it in a way too now i like that analogy i also figure if i talk for five minutes there's probably one thing that you're gonna <laughs> respond to within that answer so so then you take it from there <laughs> i have quite a few actually one is i looked at that the uh, dominance versus prestige categories. And I think about that, I think of actual people and I know of individuals that are in the dominance. And I think of it more of like a short-term punchy category versus the prestige I associated with more of a long-term uh, because it's almost like you're with a dominance, it's like action right now, action right now, uh, momentary prestige is more like things, see you in six months. Okay, maybe this will come back. It'll, it'll have like uh, longer term linkages back to you and you're not so automatically looking for an instant outcome or result in that category. Would you say that's a fair characterization? Um, I would with like some minor modifications. So I think that it is the case that I think generally if we think about like a more selfish seeming strategy, people would be like, yes, that seems more short term. Like there's no way that that's going to work long term. And I 
think that that is probably true in some instances. However, what we find in some of my work um, and in work by other hierarchy researchers is that this idea of stable hierarchies comes from somewhere, which is once hierarchies are set into place, there's momentum there. So if a person is put into a position of leadership or they end up having more influence or control over the group, it's very hard to change that dynamic. And so I always think back to like group projects from, from college where like sometimes there's a person who talks a lot at the beginning and it's not necessarily the person whose opinion is valued most, but they're just talking a lot and they're being forceful. And then it's very hard to, to change that dynamic. And that's what we see in our work is we see that dominant individuals are not liked more by their classmates and they're actually not seen as more competent and people don't defer to them. They say like, I don't value this person's opinion. I don't defer to this person's opinion, but they still are able to claim influence. And people are like, yeah, they are kind of a leader in a group, but not like leader in the rosy term that we usually think about it. It's like, this person does have influence. And that happens very early on in the group. And then over time, it's just hard to change that. So, so I think that um, it is the case, like we also um, look over the time span of months. So it's a possibility that over years, that's not the case. But if you think, and, and we, we are looking at informal hierarchy. So we look at MBA project groups, and who are not assigned leaders. And we just see like who ends up having more influence over the outcome of the group. But I think that that tendency is actually to maintain these hierarchies is even stronger in formal hierarchies because it's, you know, it's very rare for somebody to get demoted in an organization after they're put into a formal position of, of hierarchy. Um, so I, I totally agree with the sentiment that like having this longer term, more generous and communal idea of leadership seems like it will work out um, in the longer term. But the reality is like a lot of times these hierarchies are developed, developed very early on. And as a result, there's like this, this inertia of moment or momentum that's holding these dominant individuals in positions of influence, even though it's not really what people want most of the time. I have a metaphor, or not metaphor, I don't know, what, yeah, a metaphor related to this that I think of often on the freeway, if you go on the freeway and then somebody early on, you were merging and they cut you off, it'll take like eight minutes before you're able to somehow get around a bunch of cars to cut them off. So for those eight minutes, they're the leader. They were more, let's say, dominant. They took the moment. You don't like them. You're like, what? And you didn't catch up. The, and it takes so much effort to pass them up to turn around the, the uh, hierarchy or, yeah, the ranking there. So that's what I think of. And it's not like, oh, wow, our leader, our role model here. It's more like, boo, what was that? And it takes forever to, so it kind of relates in some ways there. And then yeah. the other thing you mentioned was gig work earlier. Um, would you say, by the way, uh, we have for sort of a gig society at this point, not that it's just in workplace, but also in uh, relationships and um mm -hmm interactions with people, everything is much more what can happen in the shorter term versus like there's a guarantee two years out, four years out, six years out. That's really interesting. I, I will be honest. I have not really thought about that. Um, and like how a broader orientation towards shorter or longer term things relates to those trends in our employment. Um, but I do think that's a really interesting idea. One thing I have to point out, which I think I pointed out before, I have this theme that the most, I'll use the word erudite individuals have the ability to like, that's not exactly my category of expertise and then leave it to be. And then those who may not be the most erudite will take on everything as though everything is their area of expertise when the other people might be like, that's me. how can you have 444 areas of expertise? <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's not the most applicable. I have that theme. Yeah. Though. Well, now that you've said that, I don't want to undermine it, but it did make me think of this paper that was recently published um, that I would have to remind myself of the findings. Um, but it's it's by uh, John Maynard, who is a collaborator of mine, and Connor Hasty. Um, and I think so they look they basically propose 
well, they don't propose, but there's this theory that suggests that people have different um, life history uh, strategies. And so some people have um, longer term things where they delay gratification and they, they, they're focused on achieving longer term goals. And other people, um, and I think a lot of this is, they propose is from like your experiences growing up and like economic stability and stability more generally. Other people have like more of a short term um, life strategy and the more short term life strategy um, results in behaviors that some people might like think are illogical or like not good, like spending money, as soon as receiving it or like um, having more sexual partners or engaging in riskier behavior and these things um, we might like look down on. But if you are in a more unstable environment, they're, they, they could actually be functional or they can make sense. Um, you know, like if you don't know when your next paycheck will be, it makes sense to like use the paycheck that you have on food. And so they talk about like this distinction in strategies. Um, but I will say this is like a lot of my expertise, area of expertise. So anyone who's interested, I would encourage them to look like elsewhere to like verify. Um, anyway, in this recent paper, they looked, um, at the tendency towards dominance and prestige based on this life history theory. And I don't remember precisely what the findings were, but, um, I think that the general idea was that prestige is a strategy back to what you were saying earlier, that makes more sense as a longer term strategy. So this, um, or a longer life history strategy. Um, so, so I think there are some parallels there. And I think that it's interesting, like you're proposing maybe that we're shifting towards more of a short term strategy generally as a society. And if that's the case, that could potentially have implications for the way that um, hierarchies are being navigated. Yeah. In my mind, just my the feeling is that a good percentage have deviated to the short term and then a small few at the top are still able to run a long term strategy to manage the whole thing. It's sort of like I would call it like a hill. And then uh, whereas let's say before it was 50 percent, of not 50 percent, but some percent of people here and some percent of people here. This is the short term and the long term people kind of managing the others. Now it's more like 80 percent of people have to be in this category and a small crew is just making some uh, decisions that uh, they can do casually. It's sort of like if you live in a quiet area, you have more time to think. And then if you live in a noisy area, you you think less because noise like reduces our ability to think. And then you're going to like your decisions. You're going to just throw some money away over here and then you have to pay extra interest over here. And now you're always on a short-term basis in a way. Yeah, yeah certainly. I think, I mean, you're making me want to do more reading in this area because I'm like, I wonder if they, like, who, have, who has studied this? Have people looked at these over time? That would be fascinating, but I don't, I don't know. That's cool. That's neat. Long live reading, by the way. Reading and writing, I always talk about it, and it's a good thing. Journaling, writing notes, reading new things, researching. It's the, a world I like, text, text world a lot, and taking in information. Now, your other paper, one of a few that I looked at, is called Viva la Evolution. And this yeah. one, <laughs> I, like, I wanted to make that like a statement piece. Using dual strategies theory to explain leadership in modern organizations. Uh, on this one, I had a more broad question. What, what, what are some features you would describe of a leader? What can be a leader that we look at as, okay, that's like a leader, not just a person who's leading, but a person that people want to be leaded by? Yeah, um, great question. And I, I feel like I should have explained earlier when I was talking about the dual strategies theory. Um, we, so we, this strategy, this framework initially came from evolutionary anthropology, which is hence like the Viva La Evolution title because most academics can't resist a pun, if I'm sure you've, you've read <laughs> <laughs> having done a lot of reading in this space. Um, and, and so, so evolutionary anthropologists suggest that these are these two adaptive strategies or these strategies that are like 
deeply ingrained in us as humans and they see them in small scale societies um, and we see them in MBA groups, we see them in undergrads. So that's that's where the strategy came from, um, was from, from evolutionary anthropology and psychology. Um, but to your question about what makes somebody a real leader, somebody that people want to be led by, um, I think is, is very interesting. So when I first arrived on the scene of dominance and prestige, the story at that time was very much, obviously dominant people are bad, obviously prestige people are good. So like, just do all of these prestige things, just like be confident, be caring, um, be great. Um, and be like, sympathetic to people and open to their, um, so like prestige is considered like more participative, meaning like people participate. So like the leader is not just like doing top down stuff. They're, they're more democratic and they're asking for people's opinions and all of those things as a subordinate are like so delightful to experience. And you want all of those things in your leader. Um, but since that time, there has been research indicating that with as with most things there's not like a simple answer where it's like prestige good dominance bad so we find that um dominant leaders are preferred during um periods of intense intergroup competition so if you are at like again kind of tying this back to some like evolutionary human history stuff if I'm a member of a clan and we're warring with another clan, I don't want a leader who's like, tell me your thoughts. Do you think that we should take this approach? Do you think that like we should go to war? Should we not? I want a leader who's like, we're doing this. Here's the plan. Let's go. Um, and so as a result, there's also some evidence that dominant leaders are preferred during times of insecurity um, because you want, you want strong leadership. So that, that research has emerged. There's instances where we like dominant leaders. Um, and then there's also been some research um, by my colleague and friend, Charlene Case, which is showing that prestige leaders have some downsides as well. So like they, one downside with prestige based leaders is they really love the approval of other people. And as a result, they might pander to what group members want, even if it's not the best decision for the the group because they want to be popular and they want to be liked. And so even if, you know, when given the choice between a decision that is unpopular, but better for the group or a decision that is popular, that's not for the group, prestige leaders can make choices that aren't better for the group. And I think that this is really fascinating because um, in academic research and also in public discourse, we often, like we love good leaders. And so often there's like this very rosy portrayal of good leadership. Um, and we like think about leaders as being self-sacrificing and like, we really love that narrative. Um, but in some of my work, I propose that both individuals who are inclined towards dominance and individuals who are inclined towards prestige, both may be motivated by the desire to have a position of influence. And they may take different strategies for that, but it's not like dominant leaders are selfish and prestige oriented leaders are selfless. It may be that dominant leaders are overtly selfish and prestige oriented leaders are able to claim a position of influence for themselves in a way that is more likable to other people. And so um, I think that there's like some nuance to this dichotomy. So I would really hesitate to say if you want to be a great leader, just be more prestige oriented. Um, I think sometimes the best leaders, you know, there's some like evidence from old, old school psychology that suggests like the best leader, sometimes like randomly assigning a person to be a leader is better than like figuring out who people want to be the leader or who, you know, who emerges as a leader. Um, and, and I guess that's kind of a cynical answer in some way, but when I teach these things to students, I always say, it's not, it's not like, okay, this person is dominant, this person is prestigious, or I recommend that you should be prestigious. I think about these as like tools that you should have in your toolkit. And I think the best leaders use the tools wisely. So the best leaders know when to be prestige oriented. And I think that in a lot of contexts, that's probably going to be the best, but they also know when they need to pull out some dominance. 
Um, and I think that the real danger is when you are only capable of speaking one language or using one tool. This is a great point and makes me think of how it's good to keep in mind that in the prestige category, there's room for, it's almost like a company that has mid-level management and layers of bureaucracy. After a while, there can be um, fluff added in and I'll just take 10% here and 5% here. So in the prestige category, you've built up a framework of I am this figure and obviously I've been that for a while and I didn't do it that really harsh way. So I uh, belong here. And then after some time, oh, I guess I belong here much more than those others. I'm better. So I can just take 10, 15, 20, 80% for myself, even if it's not great for my fellow people in the grouping and we all got used to it. It's like the good is then used as a, there's like a good tax in a way for that category. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm, one thing that you're mentioning that I think would be fascinating to have more research on is like what these dynamics look like in individuals over time too. Um, Cause I don't think that we have a great understanding of that right now. Um, I think the other thing that I've been thinking about in some of my ongoing work um, is when we think about these like rosy glowing leaders, we think about them from the perspective of their followers. So that's the type that all of us want. I mean, for, there's variation, right? But I think generally a lot of us really want a leader who is, asks us for our opinion and is caring and competent. Um, but in some of my work, we, that's, hopefully it will be submitted for peer review soon. We look at, we, we, we say like, yes, that's the, the language that we often focus on when we think about leaders, but in most organizations, leaders are not selected by their subordinates. They're put into place by somebody above them in the hierarchy and selecting a boss for somebody else is totally different than selecting a boss, boss for yourself. And so we find evidence that people have these biases that when they're selecting a leader for themselves, they're like, yeah, give me the prestige oriented leader. I want somebody who listens to me. They're not going to be mean to me when there's something that, you know, they, they recognize that prestige leaders will pander to the interests of subordinates. And so they're like, yep, sign me up for that. But when you're selecting a leader for somebody else, dominance doesn't seem as bad. Um, so like people still are like, yeah, we want people to generally be happy, but there's this disconnect where you don't, um, anticipate how negative the the dominant leader will be for subordinates, unless you're thinking about the dominant leader being your own leader. So I think I think that that is relevant as well um, to this idea of you know I think a lot of my work is motivated by this question of if dominant leaders are so terrible, why are they still able to get these positions of social rank or influence? And I think that's part of it is that that subordinates aren't necessarily the people that are selecting their leaders in formal hierarchies anyway. Two, two important things came to mind there. One of them is in relation to that specifically, I believe it was a Mark Zuckerberg interview where he said, when I hire somebody, I looked, I think to myself, would I work for them? So he's doing the switch so he can yeah. not be trapped by that. And then if he I would work, that, I love that. It's like yeah, a, so he doesn't fall into the exact trap you're describing. He's thinking, would I be okay being underneath them? If not, then you can't be in my corporation. Yeah. So, dang. That's a theme that hit. And then a second thing that came to mind, this is interesting, related to the leader maybe not being the best, I guess. Um, it, let's say in some categories, let's say a musical artist, they may have 800,000 fans, and their category of fans might be people who are... Uh, didn't have good upbringing, maybe you don't like themselves so much, uh, low self-esteem. And then this top musician that is their leader even likes themselves less than all of them. So they look to them as like, a, oh, okay, you're the leader of our not liking ourselves category. So even though it's the leader and they have a lot of fans, maybe not the best influence toward the group, but makes them feel better in the moment that, oh, okay, they're doing so bad. My, my, not, my doing somewhat uh, poorly is not so bad in comparison. So it's like, alternate leadership. Totally. So I think like beyond this ideas of strategies, there's also like the idea of values, which we basically don't consider in any of our work, <laughs> but I, I think it is like really important and, and relevant. Cause like we think about like, okay, like how, how are these hierarchies emerging? Who's, 
becoming a leader. And that's interesting, but it is also like, there's a pretty fundamental question of like, and what are these people, you know, what are leaders leading them towards? Um, which I which I think is interesting. We look a little bit at like how different, how dominant and prestige leaders impact group performance and people's experiences in group. But it, I think that also like begs the question of like, what, what are the goals of leaders? Um, I also think that the example of the musician is really fascinating and also relevant to the discussion of like what makes a good leader um, because there is this um, tendency of humans to value somebody on one dimension um, and as a result, treat them as a leader on every dimension. And that's the way that our organizations are structured where you have a manager of a group and that person is the manager. It's at least in theory, the manager of every dimension of the group. Um, and I think that some of the, the idea from some of this evolutionary anthropology, the idea is not that we shouldn't necessarily have global leaders. We should have people who have competence and expertise in one area, and they are the leader or owner of that area. Um, and people should defer to them for that, but, and not necessarily, um, defer to them for everything else. So like, if we really value somebody's music, that shouldn't necessarily mean that we value their opinion on politics or we, or weight loss products or, you know, like any dimension of things, but we have this tendency to think that because they are valuable and we, we value them on one dimension that they therefore should lead more broadly. And I think that, um, given that I think I don't have super optimistic views about any one person's ability to like always make the best decisions for the group. I think that another alternative is that we think about ways to distribute decision-making and influence among multiple people across different dimensions, rather than relying on one person to lead in every dimension. This is one key item that has become very noticeable in the past, let's say, eight, eight, 10 years, as there's been so many individuals showing up as an influence in some category, then the question came up after that. Great. You're the figure. What are you influencing? What's the, this part was cool, but it's almost like, uh, you got an award for a lot of listens on your music, but there was no, uh, examining of what your music did. You just got a lot of listens. It doesn't say what it caused. And as society looks more in detail at things, now it's like, okay, if the cause isn't good, then, and that person isn't causing good, and you're all really popular, then we're spreading a bunch of nonsense across the planet very quickly. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally, I think like, I think this isn't a new tendency, right? Like, this is like why we've been doing endorsements and advertising for forever, you know, because it's like, we, when we think about it rationally, it's like, Yes, my favorite basketball player shouldn't have a better idea of like what the best breakfast cereal is, um, <laughs> but, but but people really respond to that, um, and and so I don't I don't think it's a new phenomenon, but I do think that one new aspect of our society is like having so much in, insight into what people that we value on one dimension are doing on a whole bunch of different dimensions. So if I go to Instagram, I can know in detail like a whole bunch of information about the opinions of my favorite musician and that might influence my opinions on those things in a way that it hadn't in the past because I just didn't have access to that information. It is kind of funny. It's like someone being a great accountant, they are a CPA and then suddenly the teams that they like, those are more important or <laughs> the places that they like to visit. These are places that people should go more often. Yeah. It's a great, people have used that effect as you just mentioned for a long time, but it's starting to be looked at because wait, where's the skill in there? The skill has to attach to what I'm doing. Yeah. Huh. Um, we can't do it more uh, like, uh, laterally. It should be more vertical, like down to your category in a way. Yeah. Now, what is, uh, one, are there any themes you are coming up with? through your research that come to mind of hierarchy to go toward or 
Is it more looking at multiple options to choose or a better way? Um, in terms of s structuring hierarchy or navigating hierarchy or in, in any of those dimensions? Mm -hmm. Like having a, are there any best practices for, let's say there's a group of four people in a class working on a group project with their def different levels of skills. Is there a best practice or is it let things come out how they will naturally? Yeah, I so I think uh, I'm of the mentality that hierarchy is not to be escaped. So I think I like in an ideal world, you have a group of people, they have different competence, they have different strengths, and you're able to like identify those and, and perfectly like unpack what everybody's good at and work together well. Um, and sometimes hierarchy facilitates that, but often it doesn't. However, I don't think that the solution is like, we should just get rid of hierarchies in organizations or like, we should just be everyone, you know, flat, flat organizations. I don't think that that is a very realistic um, goal because we are so, hierarchy is so innate in every social interaction, even ones outside of work. Um, and so if you don't have organizational structures that reflect hierarchy, hierarchies will still emerge. They're just not going to be put on paper. Um, and, and there's also quite a bit of evidence that like hierarchies can be negative um, in terms of, you know, like what we talked about earlier, where maybe you have this person that's not that competent or that's dominant, but they like get promoted at some point for some reason, maybe because they're a man or because they're, you know, related, you know, some reason they shouldn't be there. And then as a result, like it negatively impacts the organization. So there's like definitely negative consequences to hierarchy, but there's also functions to hierarchy. So like hierarchies are really important for coordination. If we don't have a sense of what the hierarchy is, then we don't, we're constantly having to figure out how to work together as a group. And hierarchy solves a lot of these problems. Um, you know, sometimes people talk about hierarchy in terms of incentives too. Um, so like maybe I work hard because I want to be a manager at some point. So, so, so there are functions to hierarchy for one. For two, there will be hierarchy regardless. So I don't think it's a question of like, how do we get rid of hierarchy or should we get rid of hierarchy? It's like, nope, hierarchy is going to be here. It's going to emerge. Um, and that's like problematic in some ways, but also like beneficial in other ways. Um, but I think in terms of like building effective or responsible hierarchies, I think we've already talked about some of the things that I think are important. So one is thinking carefully about whether we should have a global leader or if we should have somebody that we defer to on certain issues. Um, I think that it's important that um, we do what we can to delay the emergence of hierarchies. Um, I think that by doing, so we talked about how dominant leaders claim influence early and they maintain those positions, but maybe if we just like push off leadership decisions, if you know, often in organizations, there's a couple interviews and then somebody's put into a, a position. And, and I think maybe like a trial period might be more um, responsible. I think talking to, um, subordinates might be an effective way of combating some dominant leadership. Um, and we find that dominant leadership can have negative impacts on, on group functioning. So, so I think that those things are all really valuable. And then I think um, this is where my other line of work on diversity and inclusion also comes into play because I think that one of the most detrimental things that we can do is promote people because they look like a leader to us and we have, uh, most people have stereotypes about leaders as being primarily white and primarily male. Um, and so if we're promoting people based on demographic characteristics, A, that is like problem problematic in terms of societal inequity, but it's also like not going to be detrimental because it means that very competent, capable people are not going to be promoted because they don't look like um, our, our biased stereotypes. Um, I think that you could definitely do a whole 
another episode on how we actually <laughs> combat um, um, the stereotypes in, in, in hiring and promotion and hierarchies. Um, so I, I won't really get into that, but I think that those are, you know, some of the things that if I were a leader in an organization, I would think about when I was thinking about hierarchy. Um, we also, there's like a whole nother literature on how just being in a position of power or influence can change our psyche um, and change the way that we interact with other people. And it can make us more prone to action. It can also um, mean that we're prone to some blind spots. So I think that um, that's one really valuable element of prestige-based leadership is this tendency to get be open to feedback from people who are not in a position of power, because I think that that can really help leaders mitigate some of the blind spots that they have just by being in a position of, of leadership. Taking account those individuals. So you're still grounded in some way. Yeah. One last thing I would want to check on on this one and may have Kayleen on in the future again, shout out to that <laughs> idea is, are there any individuals that come to mind that are, key individuals like uh, other researchers or authors? Is there one or two that you look to as an example or have been important in a lot of your work, like uh, very much so? Oh, great question. Um, so many. So one of my favorite hierarchy researchers is Nate Fast, who is also, he is at USC. Um, and he is doing some really fascinating stuff uh, so he actually, probably my favorite academic paper ever was was done by Nate. Um, and he talks about the difference between power, um, which is control over resources. And you can see that kind of maps onto dominance in some ways and status, which is just being respected and desired. And he has some really fascinating work that shows um, that when people have power or control, but not resources or respect, sorry, so when they power control, but not respect from other people, they tend to behave in like, pretty demeaning ways to other people. So like, if you think of not, not to throw shade at like DMV workers, but like <laughs> if we, the stereotypical DMV workers can really control your outcome, but they're not necessarily somebody that we like um, defer to in terms of their opinion. And we may like actually probably unfairly um, think, think negatively of, and as a result, they might respond to people in kind of a demeaning way. So like that, that was, that's one of my all time favorite papers. Um, that's from Nate. He has some other really great stuff. And more recently he's, um, been thinking a lot about the psychology of technology, which I think is very interesting. And I think, um, you had Juliana Schroeder on your, your show and he and Juliana collaborate, um, on some of that psychology of technology stuff, which I think is really fascinating. Um, so that is, that's some of my favorite stuff within this realm. Um, in the intergroup hierarchy world, I really love the work um, from Jen Richardson, who is at Yale, and Maureen Craig, who is at um, NYU. Um, I think they have really fascinating ways of thinking about um, hierarchy and race. Um, and Melissa Williams is also one of my favorites, who is kind of at the intersection of these two. So she's looking at power, and she also looks at um, gender. She's at Emory. Um, but I could, I mean, those are just like top of mind. I'm sure that I will, you know, end this and think, oh man, I can't believe I forgot to mention so-and-so. That's true. I don't know. Sometimes when I've been checked on some detail, I thought of two things. And then later I was like, what about these two? Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. True. Sophie Trawalter. She's one. She's another one. Again? <laughs> Who's that? Sophie Trawalter at UVA. Oh. Like and what is she, what did she research? Um, she, she does a lot on racial inequality. In oh, okay. Nice. This is a wonderful thing. May have Kayleen back on in the future. Very glad for such discussion. Glad to have had you on this one discussing dominance, hierarchy, status, some of your research and branching out to more in a good detailed way. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much. It was a delight. Same from me. <laughs>